Uh, he has been on the board of trustees for a number of years. He'll be coming off this year. But a few, few months ago, during one of our board of trustee meetings, he said to me, Pastor Mark, I want to hear you preach a message on tithing. He said, I think the church needs to hear a message on tithing. And so I said to Tab, I said, well, I think I have mentioned tithing at different points throughout the year. I've been preaching on Genesis. And we talked about a couple of passages in Genesis that mention tithing. He said, no, I don't want you to just mention tithing in one of your messages. I want you to preach an entire message on tithing. So I say all that to say this. If you don't like this message today, don't blame me. Blame Tab Robinson, okay? He's not here, but you can get on telephone, call him, send him a card, whatever you want to do. He's to blame for this message. Well, not really. I listened to what he had to say, prayed about it, and I felt like, you know, he's right. I hadn't preached on tithing for some time, and I was thinking about doing this series entitled Doing Church. And looking at different things that we do when we do church. We pray, we sing, we anoint the sick with oil. And I thought, what a great opportunity to talk about one of the things we do, or at least one of the things we should do, and that is tithe. We should tithe. Now, you might say, well, what is a tithe? Well, the tithe is when you give at least 10% of your income to God. That's what the word tithe means. It means a tenth, that you give at least 10% of your income to the Lord, to the church, so that the church can use it in the kingdom of God. And when you do that, let me tell you, the Lord will bless you. So I want to talk today about tithing. And if you have your Bible, I want you to go ahead and take it and turn over to Malachi, last book in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 6 through 12. And when you're, as you're finding your place there, I want to say to you, I believe that everyone here, if everyone here simply tithed, we would have all that we need to do God's work in this area. We have a budget. We'll be talking about that later today in our business meeting. We have a budget and we have a goal of the type of finances we need to do ministry here, I believe that if every one of us tithed, we would not only meet that budget year after year after year, but we would exceed that budget. Because I believe it's all right here. It's kind of like the pastor. He was a little bit discouraged because they had some debt that they needed to pay off in the life of the church. He was thinking about how to talk to the congregation. So he came to him one day and he said, Listen, congregation, I've got good news and I've got bad news. He said, The good news is we have all the money that we need to pay off the church's debt. But the bad news is it's still in your pockets. Now, you might think today as I'm preaching on tithing that I'm after your money. I want to say to you today, I am not after your money. I'm after your heart. I'm not looking for your money. I'm praying, though, that God would get your heart. Because if God gets your heart, he'll get your money, too. And so that's what I'm after today is your heart. So let's talk today about Malachi. Let's go ahead and read the passage. Malachi chapter 3, and I want to read verses 6 through 12. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you. That's that great word of repentance in the Old Testament. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. 
Or we might say in your tithes and your offerings. Your tithe would be the 10% you give to the Lord. Your contributions or your offerings would be what you give over and above that. For instance, like the Christ's birthday offering. Verse 9 says, you are cursed with a curse. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. This really is the classic passage on tithing in the Bible. There are other passages. I'm going to mention some of them today, but this really is the classic passage on tithing. And what we see here is God is saying, I haven't changed, but you have. That's how this passage begins. It talks about the immutability of God, which means God doesn't change. Aren't you so thankful that God doesn't change? The weather changes. Maybe your friends change. Your emotions change. Maybe your job changes. God never changes. This is how this passage begins. I, the Lord, do not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You can trust in the faithfulness of God. So the Lord begins by saying, I haven't changed. I don't change, but you have changed. He's talking to the people of God. You have changed. You have drifted from me. You're not doing my will. And so basically, God is kind of, kind of prosecuting his people. And then he says to them, return to me, and I will return to you. Again, God's not the one that changed. God's not the one that left. God says, I'm right here where I've always been. Return to me, and I will return to you. What does that remind you of? It reminds me of James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Return to me, and I will return to you. So then the people say, well, God, how do we return to you? And God said, this is how you do it. Stop robbing me. It's really interesting. Actually, the word rob is used four times in this passage. God is just hammering this home in this passage. He says, return to me and I'll return to you. The people say, okay, God, how do we return to you? God says, this is how you do it. Stop robbing me. How do you rob God? He says, stop robbing me. So the follow-up question is this. Well, how have we robbed you? He says, in your tithes and contributions. What's he saying there? The tithe belongs to me. The tithe belongs to the Lord. And so by you not giving your tithe to the Lord, keeping it for yourself, God says, you're robbing me. And so he says, hey, if you'll just do this, put me to the test. If you'll just do this, if you'll bring in the full tithe, Man, I'm going to bless you like you've never been blessed before. And so that's really what this passage is all about. And so I want to say a few things about tithing today. Basically, just two points that I want to share today concerning tithing. And, and before I share these two points, you know, some of you may be out here today and you might say, I can't tithe. I want to tithe, but I can't tithe. You might be out here today and you might be thinking, I can't put God first because I'm struggling financially. But maybe you're struggling financially because you haven't put God first. Maybe it's just the opposite. 
You're saying, oh, I can't put God first. I can't tithe because I'm struggling financially. Maybe you're struggling financially because you're not putting God first. I want to just tell you this. You need to know this before I go any farther in this message. This is all about faith. This is an act of faith. It doesn't make sense mathematically. Okay, how can 90% be better than 100%? This does not make sense mathematically. But I'm telling you, and many of you today could stand up and give a testimony. God will bless you. And you will do better on 90% than you would 100%. So let me just share two basic thoughts about tithing. First is tithing is biblical. I've already read it right here in Malachi. God says, if you're not tithing, you're robbing me. Now, some of you might be thinking, but pastor, that's in the Old Testament. That's not in the New Testament. And you might be also thinking, well, that's related to the law. We're not under the law. We're not under the old covenant. That doesn't relate to me. Well, let's go back all the way to Genesis. So in Genesis, we are going back prior to Moses, before Moses ever came on the scene, before Moses gave the law. So this is pre-Mosaic covenant. Abraham, Genesis chapter 14 and verse 20. It says, And Abram gave him, and the him is Melchizedek, and Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Right there it is, Genesis 14, 20. Before the law, before the Mosaic Covenant, pre-law, Abram, who later became Abraham, gave a tenth of everything to Melchizedek. And then later in Genesis chapter 28, and verse 22, this is Jacob, his grandson, and he says to God, and of all that you give me, I will give a tenth to you. That's Jacob. Again, this is pre-Mosaic covenant, pre-Mosaic law. Some would say, well, tithing is just old covenant. Tithing is just Moses. Moses hasn't even come on the scenes yet. Abraham tithed. Then Jacob, his grandson, tithed. And where did Jacob learn this? I guarantee you he learned it from his grandfather, Abraham. Which leads me to say, parents, are you teaching your children about tithing? Grandparents, are you teaching your grandchildren about tithing? And if you're not tithing yourself, they're not learning it. They need to see it by example and also hear it in terms of instruction. Well, still, you might say, well, Pastor Mark, you're quoting from Malachi and you're quoting from Genesis. Well, let me quote the words of Jesus. Matthew 23, 23. He's talking to the Pharisees, which was a group of religious leaders that were known, not all of them, but many of them were known for their hypocrisy. Outwardly, they looked really righteous, but inwardly, they had a lot of junk in their life. So this is what he says to them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe, is what he says. Oh, it's good, you tithe. You tithe mint and dill and cumin. But you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others or without neglecting the former. What's Jesus saying here? Well, he's, he is saying there are more important things than tithing but tithing is still important. There are more important things than tithing, but tithing is still important. He says, hey, you need to do justice and mercy and faithfulness. Do these things without neglecting the former. Keep tithing. That's a good thing, Jesus says. But you need to add mercy, faithfulness, justice. This is the way I look at it. I'm not going to be legalistic today. But this is the way I look at it. If under the old covenant, they gave 
Would I want to do any less under the new covenant? I thought the new covenant was greater than the old covenant. I thought we had more of the Spirit and more of the blessing of God and a greater knowledge of the Lord through Jesus Christ. So if under the old covenant, if you say, well, I'm connecting tithing directly with the old covenant and only with the old covenant, if that's how you view it, for argument's sake, let's say you're right. Well, if under the old covenant, they gave 10% of their wealth to God, you telling me we should do less under the new covenant? I thought we should do more. And if you say, well, I just want to be a New Testament Christian. Well, you know, Jesus came to a rich young ruler one time. And he said to that rich young ruler, I want you to give it all away. 100% give it all away. Give it to the poor and come follow me. I tell you what, in light of that story, 10% doesn't look too bad, does it? If they gave 10% under the old covenant, we shouldn't do less under the new. Maybe we should do more. And some New, new Testament Christians gave everything. They gave it all. You know, I know many of you out here, you tithe, and we appreciate it. And there's a lady in our congregation named Marta Dennis. Many of you know her. She believes in tithing. And she shared a story with me. You know, her husband Jeff passed a few years ago. And, you know, she's now a widow. And she had some property where their house was. And a big storm came along, knocked down a bunch of trees. And she had to go find someone to clean it up. Found this young man that was willing to do it and even going to give her a break because Jeff had been his instructor at shop at, at the high school, I guess it was. And so he said to her, I'll do it for $2,000. I'll clean everything up, take care of all of it. So she went to the bank and where her money was. And Jeff took care of all the finances, so she wasn't as involved with the finances. So she went there to the bank and what but what, there was this savings account that Jeff had off to the side she didn't know about. It wasn't that he was hiding anything from her. He, he went on this golfing trip every year with the guys, and he would set aside money throughout the year. And in that account, there was $2,200. And she said, Pastor, I had exactly enough to pay for my trees to get cleaned up with $200 left over. If my mathematics are correct, that would be a tenth. And she brought that and she gave that to the Lord. I want to tell you, God will bless you. God will bless you. Which leads me to my second point. Not only is tithing biblical, tithing leads to God's blessings. I want to say that today. Now, we do not teach here the health and wealth gospel. The health and wealth gospel is if you really serve the Lord, you're never going to get sick. You're going to be filthy rich. You're going to have Mercedes Benzes and yachts and so forth and so on. We don't teach that here, but don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. The Bible does talk about the blessings of God. And he's not just talking about spiritual blessings. He's talking about financial blessings. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. It says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. See how the Lord said, I'm just going to bless you. You're going to have more than you need. Uh, Malachi chapter 3. I've already read it, but let me read to you again, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So usually in the Bible, and it's even one of the commandments that Jesus mentioned when he was being tempted in the wilderness by Satan, usually when you have the idea of testing God, God is saying, don't test me, right? Right? Isn't one of the commandments, you shall not test the Lord your God? 
Like all through the Bible, over and over again, the people of God are actually criticized and rebuked for testing God. And yet here is one of those unique places in the Bible where God invites you. He says, test me, prove me, try me, and see if I won't open the floodgates of heaven. I'm just going to bless you again. Some of you out here today might be thinking, I can't put God first because I'm struggling financially. But maybe you're struggling financially because you haven't put God first. And when you put God first, what does he say? I'm going to open the floodgates of heaven. I'm going to bless you and bless you. You won't even have enough room to store it all. Luke chapter 6, verse 38, this is Jesus. He says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Give and it will be given to you. Again, not the health and wealth gospel. We're not here saying, well, if you give this amount of money, God's going to give you this amount back. God is God. But I can tell you as a personal testimony in my life, and many of you here could get up today and share testimonies of equal nature, maybe greater, God blesses when you give to Him. He blesses you spiritually, yes, but He also blesses you financially and materially. It just is a fact. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. So in this passage, God says, I have not changed. You have. You know, you can drift. You can drift. Things that you were taught as a child, things that you know are in the Bible, you can drift. God says, I haven't changed. You have. But, and this is the encouraging word, God says, I will forgive it all. Return to me and I will return to you. That's grace right there. And the people say, well, okay, well, maybe we do want to return to you. How do we do it? In this particular context, he says, stop robbing me. And again, you know, you think, how can you rob God? He says, you're robbing me because you're not giving the tithes and the offerings. Now, again, you might say, well, why is repentance here connected to tithing? I thought you said that tithing is not the most important thing. I thought Jesus said tithing is not the most important thing, that they're weightier matters of the law. Well, tithing is not the most important thing, but that doesn't mean tithing is not important. And how you relate to money shows a lot of where your heart is. How you relate to money, how you spend your money, all of that basically shows how you feel about God, and how you relate to God. You can't outgive God. So I came to this church in 1995 to be the associate pastor. And I remember, I think it was the very first message that I heard Brother Curtis preach on this stage behind that big white pulpit. You all remember the big white pulpit that used to be here? And he was preaching on tithing, and I think it was out of Malachi chapter 3. And he was preaching, and he was about to end his message, and he walked right down on the main floor, just like I am right now. And he said, he said, I'm going to make you a deal. He said, if you will commit to tithing this year, and you're not blessed at the end of the year, we'll give you all your money back. About five of the trustees fainted right then in the congregation. They had to go get the nurse to come in and do CPR on them. I remember sitting there, and I thought, is he really serious? It seemed like he was serious. I don't think anybody called. If, did any of y'all call at the end of the year and get your money back? I probably should have checked on that before I shared this illustration. I don't remember anyone calling at the end of the year. I don't remember them giving anybody's money back. But i tell you one thing I learned. That man really believed in tithing. For him to get up publicly and say, if you will commit for one year and God hasn't blessed you, we'll give you your money back. That man really believed in tithing. 
I want to tell you, God will bless you. I can't tell you how much. I'm not here to get into all of that. I am here to say, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We don't believe in the health and wealth gospel. That doesn't mean we don't believe God will bless you. Spiritually, yes. Materially, too. Don't say, I can't put God first because I'm struggling financially because maybe you're struggling financially because you're not putting God first. What did Jesus say? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. You can't outgive God.